I've seen some amazing changes in recent years, and but I think they can do more um, to enable that uh, more inclusive environment, less bureaucratic, uh, more fast moving, which uh, ultimately is going to provide the innovation necessary because you can't innovate in within a dinosaur like structure right um and corporations know a lot about that like you you sometimes have to create an entirely new division that's going to handle the innovation part because if you get stuck in the recesses of the traditional sort of divisional responsibilities etc things will be so slowly moving that you'll miss out on the innovation opportunities so i i, I think there's opportunity for the multilaterals like the united nations um to to really change and adjust. Professor Nikki Eberhardt is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Nikki's life goal is to power people with audacious solutions armed to tackle the globe's most intractable challenges. She seeks to disrupt at, in, at the intersection of tech and scalable social impact. She is assistant professor of business at Minerva, teaching startup finance, marketing, and global business. She has a master's in international development, an MBA from Sade Business School at Oxford, and a PhD in global sociology. Nikki is on Delta Airlines global talent team to craft leadership development and mentor culture strategies. She is EVP Impact E3 plus director partnerships of Z School, pioneering a digital platform with influencers, brands and charities so Gen Z can, aff uh, can affect change. She works with global citizens a movement harnessing voices of influencers, world leaders, and corporates with 8 million global citizens to end poverty, raising over 48 billion US dollars in commitments and driving 25 million plus digital actions to set to affect 2.5 billion people's lives. She has many accolades and accomplishments as a presenter at TEDx Oxford and MC and host for NASA Space Center Cross Industry Innovation Summit at Vienna Power Pioneers Technology Summit, where she was the MC and wonderful moderator for a little panel talk that, that I was on, a moderator and, and conveyor for San Francisco Professional Business Women of California Conference, o Oxford said Business School Capstone, Davos World Economic Forum event and Skull World Forum for Blockchain AI Impact Investing. I could go on and on, but I want to give you one final thing in her bio that's really important. Actually, two things. She is the co-founder and president of the United Nations Women's Chapter. And she has this beautiful quote that says, tackling the globe's most Intractable challenges requires audacious solutions. I'm honored to team up with the Minvera faculty and staff as we build the next generation of students, leaders, and innovators who will shape a bright future. Welcome to the show, Nikki. It's so good to have you. I, I will call you Nikki because we're kind of getting closer over all these years that our paths have crossed and uh, the last time I believe I saw you was in, in uh, Bountiful, Utah. That's correct, Mark. Nice to see you as well. Uh, great to reconnect virtually after all of the crazy of 2020. That is, that is absolutely for sure. Tons of crazy. And it's always beautiful to reconnect from you. And, and just again, for my listeners, we met as you were emceeing, moderating for pioneers in on uh, Austria and um, the beautiful Hofburg Palace, wonderful location. They treated us like kings or royalty anyway. I felt that way and uh, did a wonderful job. And uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm estranged from our, our, our colleague who, who was on the panel with me, but I'm glad that you and I are still connected. 
That's fabulous. Yeah, you, you, it, it was lovely to have you, Mark. It, it was a, it was quite an amazing event, wasn't it? The contrast of this very historical um, palace with drones flying around and, and robots roaming the stage. And the way they did, they did some kind of a virtual dancing and they did all sorts of amazing, innovative, cool things there. Um, the other thing is not only is our past crossed because we have a, a family and, and that living in, in certain areas, but you're also very active to date and in the past uh, with Global Citizens. It's a fabulous movement. And uh, I finally made it to the visionary level. I mean, I, I think it's beyond the amount of points you can accumulate on on their app. And, and I just love um, the organization and everything that they do. That's for SDG number one, no, no poverty. But in reality, have you figured out that it actually ties to almost all the other 17 SDGs? They're inextricably connected to one other, another, are they not? We have to simultaneously tackle all of them or we won't make headway on any of them. Absolutely, for sure. So um, right off the bat, I wanna get into, so you, you, you teased it already, we've all been through this crazy time. So all this years of experience that you, you've had and experiencing a lot of work with uh, global poverty and, and at these events and talking about innovations and seeing both sides of human suffering, environmental problems, but as well as those innovations and social entrepreneurs and education on those people who really wanna, wanna get to a better world. Did any of that prepare you for Black Lives Matter, COVID, uh, the inauguration, and and all the other craziness that's gone on during this time. How have you weathered absolutely. the storm? Yeah, absolutely madness. Um, could have never foreseen, could not have written a playbook that would have incorporated all of the madness we've experienced. Um, however, what it has exposed is not only the cracks and the weaknesses and the brokenness of many of the systems from higher education institutions to inequality both within and across countries to weakness in political systems and the vulnerability of democracies in the United States but around the world. Uh, could not have foreseen that. How have I personally weathered this? Well, I've learned from the best. I've seen the innovators in the space from the young global social entrepreneurs, um, specifically my Minerva students, who are building the businesses of the future that have a profit mechanism so that they are sustainable and scalable, but they're embedded in tackling the most intractable challenges around the planet. And they have really innovative technologically driven solutions to do that. Um, to what I'm seeing with Global Citizen, my colleagues at Global Citizen, who are pulling together the most powerful, the most non-obvious partnerships from civil society, to government heads of state, to corporate CEOs and founders, to startup founders, um, to influencers, to musicians, uh, pulling them all together in the most unlikely of ways, both in 2020 and 21 virtually, as well as historically our in-person events, uh, to really move the needle around those issues related to poverty, all of the SDGs. Um, right, um, and and sort of curating and selecting which is most appropriate in that global moment um, to really capitalize, to really harness, to really drive uh, the value from global citizens to not only build awareness, but to um, essentially um, really uh, get get the dollars and the political will behind movement, um, because we all have to do this together. I mean, what Mark, I think it's also exposed, as I mentioned, the cracks in the system. Um, it's, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the inequality, uh, the poorest of the poor continue to be disenfranchised, and that pace is accelerating, unfortunately. Um, uh, people of color around the world, vulnerable populations, refugee populations. And so my heart breaks for them. But what it does is light a, a, a 
bigger fire underneath me to really get going and really finding those scalable innovative solutions that are going to make the difference because we don't have time to waste. I feel an absolute urgency um, to scale up what I was doing before in more meaningful ways now, given the challenges that we're facing. So I believe we have a mutual friend from Global Citizens, Deb Kaplan. We do. Oh, she's such a lovely person. Yes. And um, she actually it was during the lockdown. She she did some work for COGX and she contacted me and I ended up doing a, 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 an event for COGX with her. But she's also done a lot for uh, Global Citizens and and. I, I guess first and foremost, uh, I'm glad that you've weathered. I'm glad that you have these mentors that have really not only given you good examples of how we can get through this, but some other operating models. And, and it's really also at the ground level from the bottom up because you've got students who are just kind of starting out on this uh, adventure, this journey, startups, inventors, people who want to change the world, solve our global grand challenges. And you get to see it right on the front lines, that development and that excitement uh, of those things. So you're really fortunate. But also, I think in, during this time, you graduate from somewhere, finish a degree and do some cool things. Can you tell us about that? You bet. Yeah. So to speak to your first point, I mean, it's, it's, it's hugely exciting in watching these students develop because cr the critics would, would say that they have naivete. Um, the optimists, and I would argue the realists would say, no, it's simply um, untethered idealism that is required right now in this time for the type of disruption we need to overhaul the brokenness of the systems. And so I have this a backstage pass to witness it um, and to help sort of um, really uh, foster these kids' ideals and, and help direct them in uh, ways that are really going to make the difference. So with respect to my own educational background, I never intended to, to be a professional student for so many years. I mean, yikes, uh, that wasn't fun. Uh, but yeah, I did complete my PhD uh, over a year and a half ago. And, and I was also simultaneously doing my MBA at Oxford. Um, so I've been a professor with Minerva for nearly three years now. Um, and and it, I've been able to work with this disruptive higher educational um, uh, approach, essentially. And so it it really tailors itself to my innovation needs. Um, and I consider myself um, an entrepreneur at the end of the day. So it satisfies that. And I can also do a bit of academia um, at the same time. So it's working. I, it's definitely working. So I, th I, I see that you're doing well, and I'm glad to hear that. But it's also, I think there's some form of disruptiveness from you as well. I think you sometimes spur the extra thought or in your students to say, hey, let's think a little bit bigger, or a little bit more disruptive. Uh, and I, I mean, I, it just goes right along with what you said as well. During this time, it was a time that the microscope was shown on every big problem that we had. Uh, all the problems and, and uh, cracks were bubbled to the surface, so to say. And we really got a microscopic view and what's wrong and what needs to be fixed. And uh, besides feeling the great unrest or dis-ease at the current civilization frameworks or systems that we're operating on that are just failing humanity, you know? And so I, I, I love that you're on the front line, but I, I also am extremely glad that you're so positive and excited through this crazy time. You haven't well, listen, buried your head in the sand. Well, listen, I have those days, especially when my teenagers are misbehaving, <laughs> um, where I simply want to crawl in a hole in the fetal position. Um, but at the end of the day, can we afford that? I mean, yes, we're human. Yes, it's okay to have really down days. Um, I'll be honest, it's been the worst year on record for me. Um, but there's also a light at the end of the tunnel. 
And I have to believe that we're not only going to weather this, that humanity will come out on top. Because what we've realized through these challenges is that the human centric approach and the ecologically centric approach is the only way forward. We don't really have an alternative, right? So for example, I also work for Delta Airlines on the, the global talent team. And we announced losses of over $9 billion in 2020. Um, we were just cited by Fortune as being the world's best airline for the 10th year in a row. We have an incredible mentor leadership culture at Delta Airlines. And we're working to uh, foster those leadership opportunities for our senior level leaders. Um, we've seen some huge disruption. It's been really hard. People have had to take on roles that historically were not theirs, um, that they were less comfortable um, acquiring. And they've rallied, uh, so to speak. They've done it in beautiful ways. Um, they've done it in ways that have demonstrated their resilience, um, their ability to innovate in hard times. And I think as a result, it's sort of um, created different pockets, different holes. It's exposed the gaps, but it's created these new sort of opportunity zones that had we not gone through what we did in 2020, we wouldn't have seen. You know, I could say the same thing for Minerva. I can say the same thing for Global Citizen. I mean, essentially, uh, an organization that really focuses those, those global moments and opportunities around huge, massive events in a world where a six feet distance and wearing masks is now the norm. Um, you have to completely innovate around a new model, right? So you find the technological tools available. Delta's done that, Minerva's done that, Global Citizen's done that. You pull the best heads in the space, those innovators that are gonna make it happen, and then you recreate. You don't have an alternative. But in that recreation process, there's an amazing opportunity because you have the opportunity to recalibrate, to say, okay, that particular procedure or that process or that orientation or that goal or that mindset was less, less helpful. Frankly, maybe it wasn't human centric and it wasn't focused on the right goals around saving the planet. And so here's the recalibration. Here's how we're going to sort of reorient and recreate. And, and so I've found across these industries and sectors, this opportunity zone, um, which I think is really going to propel us forward um, into 2022 and beyond. I love that. Did, now, were you working online with the students as well before the pandemic? Or did that take a drastic switch as well. Yeah, we were uniquely positioned at Minerva. So we were essentially a startup six years ago. And our, our founder and CEO, Ben Nelson, um, he is a tech entrepreneur, serial tech entrepreneur. He went to some of the biggest VCs in Silicon Valley and he said, listen, here's the market need. We have some of the most competent, capable students around the world who are simply either not getting into Ivy League schools or because of visa restrictions or socioeconomic status, uh, currency exchange rates, for example, um, they're not able to attend um, these best schools. And so we want to create an opportunity and essentially democratize higher ed. So he had no problem amassing the support of, of a lot of the uh, biggest sort of capital yielding institutions. And so we've built this business and this nonprofit organization in the higher education um, university um, to essentially offer this education to these students. So our students hail from over 100 countries. Um, they live as cohorts in seven global cities over four years, but we have an entirely new pedagogy, a new curriculum, and a new tech platform from which we deliver. Our tech platform is virtual. So before Zoom was a thing, <laughs> I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't a thing like it's a thing now. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't um, we were as our, up there with uh, Tesla and the others as far as profits. Exactly. We were already delivering uh, this new pedagogy and curricula vis-a-vis uh, -vis this tech platform. Uh, 
So my colleagues, uh, faculty at the university live all over the world. And so we deliver to these students who happen to be living together as cohorts all over the world as well. So we love the model. Um, were we impacted um, adversely by the last year? Certainly in some regards, but in other ways, uh, we were already uniquely positioned better than others. Um, conversely, you know, uh, other service industries, um, entertainment, um, but nonprofit organizations have really been hit hard. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's working with those partners, it's, um, it's, uh, it's continuing to innovate, but yes, Minerva has been uniquely positioned to do well throughout all of this. Before the um, pandemic, I was actually working with the Sky Team, which is Delta as part of the Sky Team, on implementing the sustainable development goals into actionable items that could be done throughout the uh, and entire Sky Team, uh, as well as the new things that were coming along in January 2019. There were some new international implications around Corsia, which is the carbon offsetting uh, scheme from the United Nations um, agency around international air travel. Um, that was, you know, what's the future of aviation? How we're going to do carbon offsetting? How we're going to get those schemes? And how can we implement the SDGs to create that better future? And, and actually, on Valentine's Day uh, uh, in February, your Delta's president came out and, and CEO came out and basically said, you know, we're going to go carbon neutral. Where he also said something caveated before that that we're doing very well. We're going to give back to our employees and and take care of them and, and, and shares. Um, but we're gonna go carbon neutral and, and here's how we're gonna do it through innovation, through carbon offsetting, through, through these technologies. And, and it's not gonna be easy, but we're committing to it. I think he said March 1st is the day it goes live. We're gonna do it. And then the craziness uh, occurred, hit, uh, it was unbelievable. And I, I'd, I actually spoke about about it at uh, DLD and, and on stage in Boma and in Paris and, and in front of uh, you know what a couple four or five thousand people, and and mentioned Delta and the great ambitions that they set that it was a historical precedence that an airline uh, industry did that and at the same time just before that in January Microsoft had made their historical ambitions to say that they're going to do a fund, but they, they says, we're going to remove our historical carbon emissions. So there, it was really the decade starting out to be the decade of action and some super things, positive ways going forward. Um, and, and then the pandemic hit. Matter of fact, I was stuck. I, I was in the United States because I was doing an event with Al Gore in Las Vegas to train uh, climate leaders and I was a mentor uh, at that event, but that got canceled as well. But I, and, and I had several other events in the US. And so I was um, in, the, in Utah, matter of fact, visiting family uh, during that time when President Trump at that time came on and you know, did the lockdown. And, um, and then the day I was supposed to fly out, there was an earthquake. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's been a trying and interesting time but as you know, uh, as well, I've, I've been working remotely. I'm from the US, I live in Hamburg, Germany and, and uh, been kind of living in the future, working in the future, the, the, the humans of, of new work, how, how do we work and educate each other? But during that time that relates to, to Minera, uh, Minerva is basically um, we did a setup for school age children who, were stuck at home with not enough computers, with no internet, no no schooling, uh, on, on and on. So we came up with TED Education and um, the United Nations and UNESCO and uh, the World Economic Forum and many others. And we created what was called Earth School, a 60 day quest. And just in the first seven days of, of that pro uh, launch of, of this project for kids who are now need some education and tie environment and, and, and things into that and do part of it online and the other part of the quest outside in nature to rediscover what's going on on our planet. 
seven million people in the first week, and then 70 million um, by the time we hit the first month. And it was very successful and it's still available to, to go through. But uh, that brings me to this kind of a transition to education that, uh, that we need to talk about and address because it's, it's one area that's been stuck in the dark ages almost uh, for, for a long time in, in many, not, not all schools, but in many aspects, especially grade school and, and um, just some old, old ways of learning, old ways of teaching, old technologies. And if you were to look at a high school or a school, you know, back in the 40s or 50s, uh, it looks pretty much the same as it does today in, in most places, especially in developing countries. And um, before I get to the question, I have to just caveat, on August 21st, uh, 2020, we lost uh, Sir Ken Robinson. And uh, I had Graham Martin Brown on the show, who was a colleague and also did a book together with Sir Ken Robinson. But he was a great mentor and a great person around education, transforming, changing the entire educational system and setting the vision of how we can do it differently. Uh, I see that when I look at you, I see that when I hear your stories about Minerva, that you really want to do things differently in the education system and that you're also seeing over the years, all the problems bubbling to the surface. What are you doing to address it? What's going on? Give us the exciting news because I know it's not a doom and gloom. I, I, I can see in your eyes, the optimism of where we're going. And, and that's really what I, I want to hear about. I love it. Thanks for sharing your experience with EarthQuest. I think that's a nice sort of case study of what can be done. Um, so I'd like to speak from, you know, address your questions from essentially two different angles. Number one is we need to sort of revolutionary, revolutionize and really be informed by the, the latest in learning science, which teaches us how to teach best, right? Um, so that we have active, engaged learners, so that the retention is there, the creativity is there, uh, the cognitive abilities are developed, the communication skills um, are provided. And there is amazing research there um, that really sort of uh, illuminates what we can do differently, right? We're, as you said, we're stuck in the 1950s model. It's antiquated and it's not working. Um, so we can change how we do that. We can change our expectations of when students enter a classroom, having prepared in advance. So we're not simply regurgitating information and on repeat, but rather, um, how can we help take them next level and in deep learning, far transfer opportunities where they can take one concept or one framework and apply it across contexts to all af different aspects of their lives, irrespective of what professional careers they pursue. Um, so if we harness that in the right way, and I would argue Minerva is doing a pretty good job and there are other players in the space also um, working to sort of revolutionize that, that's a first step. I think the second is a more structural, larger issue around um, the requirements now and given the technologies we have at our disposal, the requirements that education needs to be really blended. There's nothing that can that can replace that important one-on-one -on -one mentorship model, right? And there is an important sort of social dynamic of being in a same physical space at some point. But in order to really scale education and provide the quality that's needed, we need a blended learning models in delivering education vis-a-vis -vis different modalities. So part e-learning, um, part, you know, virtual live sessions, part face-to-face, -face, part one-on-one -on -one mentorship models. And um, that's important. But then we say, okay, we have X billion number of children around the world. How many of those kids live in developing countries? And how many of them have access 
to the digital technologies that are needed in order to enable this kind of learning environment. Not very many of them, right? Yeah. Exacerbated by the pandemic. Exactly. So I have a friend at UNICEF who's trying to raise funds currently to provide any sort of education to the most vulnerable children around the world, kids living in refugee camps in Lebanon and um, uh, the border of Bangladesh, right? Um, the, the Rohingya uh, refugee children living there all over the world, vulnerable populations in urban spaces, um, children who are homeless. All of these kids are in jeopardy of being left further behind as education sort of comes to pace with where it needs to be in the 21st century. They're at greater risk, right? So we see an increasing divide between the haves and the have-nots. So it's an important sort of reality to understand so that we can target our systemic change more appropriately. How do we help enable uh, digital access bandwidth issues to kids in these spaces? They, the hardware that they need in order to go online, um, they have to be able to, to access that if they really wanna be part of the global currency, the global economy, the global society of the 21st century, right? And so I think it, it becomes our burden, but most importantly, our opportunity to help um, facilitate the right partnerships, get the capital to where it needs to be. Think of innovation, of innovative solutions that are disruptive, not on the margins, not like a slight tweak to an existing system or like here's our, here's our education model, we're going to just tweak this element, but rather like totally revamp um, those systems in order to make it more equitable and more accessible to all kids around the world. You've opened up a couple areas that I want to go a, a little bit deeper into. So I, ha I had Audrey Tang, the uh, Minister of Taiwan, uh, Digital Minister of Taiwan on the podcast. And he said, broadband is a human right. You know, and I really had to think about that, you know, and it is so true that um, we, I mean, in the pandemic, we've heard it, you know, that uh, kids are going to the McDonald's or the local uh, fast food place sitting outside in the parking lot to get internet to do their homework or, you know, uh, things like, things like that, you know, and um, then also during the pandemic, there was from a friend of mine, Tristan Harris, who came out with the social dilemma, which is kind of adding the aspect of social digital tech, you know, and um, he, he, he really talked about how we need to have humane technology that's going in the right direction, that's pushing us in the right uh, solutions, um, which leads me, how, how are what are you working on? How is Minerva working on these that this, uh, the, the adults, the entrepreneurs, those that we're pushing into this future aren't, aren't running into some of these older problems and how are they working on these other solutions where if they have people from uh, um, different countries from all over the world studying with Minerva, do they, the, there's gotta be some broadband or some connection issues sometimes with, with those people on, uh, are they doing, are there some things in place that bring hope or that resolve that through, through the school? Yeah, excellent. I like what your guest shared with respect to brand, you know, re-envisioning broadband as a human right. And, you know, and therefore I think it, it puts, um, really front and center that responsibility we have to um, enable access. Listen, at the end of the day, um, I, I worked in the nonprofit space for over 20 years, but I also work in the, in the private sphere. And as I become older, I essentially made an intentional pivot towards business because I wanted to tackle the same global intractable challenges. But I saw that there were a lot of important business solutions that could provide um, uh, growth and opportunity in ways that kind of 
sometimes the antiquated multilateral approach um, and even the nonprofit space just didn't have the capital to do, right? And so how could the, pr the private sector inform or shape or at least partner up with the best of the multilaterals and the best of the nonprofits and the best of civil society to really make that happen? Because there's a lot to be learned from business in terms of efficiency, scalability, um, ability to grow rapidly, right? And so if, if we're talking about access to broadband, I mean, this is in part a private sector innovation, right? And so I think we need to enable the businesses to do their best work, but we need to change the incentive structure, right? We need to tap the best of their corporate social responsibility or enable those team ups with those boots on the ground, which are often the nonprofit organizations, certainly civil society, um, government entities, and the multilateral institutions um, to really say, this is what needs to be done. You can provide the capital and you have a lot of the know-how. So let's create this team up because you know we don't have a magic wand to essentially say, here's broadband, everyone has access. We need to change the incentive structure for all of the stakeholders so that that becomes attainable. And, and I, I see some really interesting models out there that are doing that. Um, Elon I, I Musk, know. Starlink Broadband as one, and there, there's a bunch exactly. of others. Yeah, really great. Excellent example. That's it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so uh, I see appetite out there. And I say differently than even what I witnessed 10 years ago. There is more of a desire coming from numerous stakeholders across sectors and industries to team up. Um, I think we're all as a human race realizing that like redundancy is wasteful and that we simply don't have the time horizon to experiment in silly sort of isolated siloed ways. So like, how can we increase impact? Let's do it together. So there's this level of collaboration that I think has become the norm um, with the best companies and with the most innovative governments and with the best social entrepreneurs, um, we're, we're really saying, okay, how do we create that collaboration? Where is that powerful team up um, that's going to, you know, enable brand bend access to Syrian refugees all throughout the Middle East, right? What, what is that going to look like? And what's going to be required of each of those stakeholders in order to make that happen? And how are those incentive structures? And we can say it's a carrot and stick approach, yeah. but how can we change those incentive structures um, to foster that? We're definitely uh, on a path and roadmap towards, you know, uh, broadband for all. There's not just Starlink broadband, there's many others emerging, but it's this, um, one thing that you, you say about business and how the, not only the opportunities there, but the, the biggest force for impact and, and disruption to, to get that world w where we need to be, um, which leads nicely into to, to kind of my first real big question for you. And that is, um, do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about a world without nations, borders, divisions, humanity, one from another? And the reason I ask that, I don't want to tie it back to, to what you said about business. Believe it or not, businesses have been operating as global citizens for a long time. If you look at a, a trade map, a digital trade map from satellite data, um, pretty much global. You know, if you look at the way food moves around our world, Food as a global citizen, definitely during this time of a pandemic, uh, the pandemic's been a global citizen, but uh, there's many things that are global citizens and operating that way for quite some time. But in a time of like this humanity, we've been locked down, we've been separated from each other, we've been distanced and, and uh, this us against them type of thing has really emerged. And so I kind of caveat it with that question with those buy-ins. Yeah. 
the the cynics would say, well, that's great. Thinking of a borderless world, what a utopian ideal, right? And we've seen the rise of nationalism. Um, these these sort of movements ebb and flow, but it's been very stark. Um, what has happened in, in recent years, both in the United States as well as around the world. Um, and, you know, one could argue that these, these borders are in essence antiquated because it's trying to restrict the flow. It's like a fast moving river that gravity is pulling down, down the mountain towards the ocean. Right. And nothing can really stop it, but attempts will be made to dam up that river or, you know, to put put some sort of stone in the way to sort of divert the path. Um, but is is it really possible and is it is it useful to do that? I would argue no. Um, but I think we also have to um, cooperate with people who may be across the aisle maybe have very divergent opinions in terms of how they see solving global problems. Um, and we're so divisive around the world right now that I think we have to find some sort of middle ground. And so however we want to message that um, can look different. But I think ultimately, if we speak to everyone's sort of best ideals, that this is the global we live on. It's in all of our best interest that we come together in meaningful ways to, to save the ecology of the planet and also to provide opportunities for every human to be his or her best self, right? And so, you know, what, what does that actually look like? I think it's going to be different for every person, but we can find some sort of middle ground because if just this side is just hacking away at it and this side is is pushing directly in opposition to it we won't make any movement we have to find a middle ground and sort of move towards something together i'll give an illustration um, at minerva we provide foundational concepts um, and then we ask them to sort of build their understanding and their case studies and their context of the real world around those things and one of those concepts is hashtag system dynamics, where we try to illuminate to students that everything is interconnected, right? There's a larger system and to borrow a really bad, um, a really bad sort of airline analogy, it's the 35,000 foot view. Here you are on the ground, you're on the tarmac. Let's say, Mark, you're going from Hamburg to Salt Lake City, Utah. You're gonna take off and you know what that's like, like you're looking around the infrastructures here, these humans are sitting next to you, like you're familiar with that environment. And then you take off in that plane. And as you ascend, everything on the ground becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And you start identifying these different like almost nodes. Here's a car, but it's a node and here's a house and it's a node and a school and a grocery store and all of these things. And then you start seeing it from a very different perspective, the higher you go. And when you cap at 35,000 feet, which is your cruising altitude, you're going to see things very differently, right? It'll be more of a systems perspective because now you're seeing not the nodes of a car to a house, but you're seeing a city to a city, right? An ocean to a river. And it looks very different. And so encouraging my students and thinking about how we're solving all of these problems, it's like, let's, let's reach into each of our human best selves. And irrespective of your politics and how ins insane I may feel that was, you know, your choice you made, or, you know, that thing you're saying about kind of this nationalistic uh, take or trying to create subsidies to restrict trade or whatever it is, um, Let's put those things aside. Let's kind of get rid of the ideology and the dogma for just a moment. And let's try to see that 35,000 foot view together. And then enumerate, identify what your top three sort of objectives will be, and then proceed together. We got to do it together. Absolutely, for sure. So I, I, I've got a couple books here. I'm, well, I, I don't know if I should show them to you because you're speaking to my heart. One is the systems view of life from Fritzolf Capra. It's the Capra course that, that he gives on the systems view of life. 
Uh, the other one is thinking in systems and the limits to growth from Donella Meadows, who talks about systems thinking and dynamic modeling. Um, I'm a big uh, dynamic modeling uh, person, and I really speak a quite a bit about uh, platform systems dynamic models for businesses that the, the most successful organizations, companies in the world are run on, on these type of models that address all facets of a very complex system. But the book I wanted to show you was called The Overview Effect. It's from Frank White. It's basically that cosmic perspective, that overview effect that astronauts get, about 550 people to date have had that perspective. It's the same that you're discussing with the 35,000 foot view um, from an airplane, from, from a different view of perspective. It changes, it's, it's a shift in cognitive awareness. It's a shift in how we see our world, our home. Uh, I'm not sure if I would say we become a node or become a number, but we have this cognitive shift in awareness that says, I'm on the same boat as, as Nikki. I'm on the same boat as those people from China and Africa and all over. And, this same spaceship Earth, and I'm not a passenger. I'm a crew member. I can put my hands on that steering wheel of, of the spaceship Earth and guide at least my direction to the future, a little bit of the Earth's direction of the future. And so I'd love, I mean, you just speak to my heart when, when you say those things. But I mean, I, I kind of knew that as well from, from pioneers and different things that we, we, we need to to take this uh, systems view approach to life, this bigger view of the world we live in and find that middle ground to, to, to move forward. And so that really leads me to my hardest question that I have for you today. And it is the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, Although maybe you, you said it in the past pandemic time or in the past year, it's what's the future? What's the future? Wow. And so, uh, so, I mean, you're saying we find middle ground. You're saying, you know, saying this bigger overview, but I'd like to know from you and I, not even so on a political or, or bigger level, kind of what do you think is the solution for the future? What's the future? Where are we going? What's the roadmap or the plan? Mm -hmm. What is the roadmap? So I, th I think you have to get clear on what the ultimate objective is, right? And I would say happiness and ability to live as, as everyone would like and in order to live out his or her dreams. So how do we do that? Well, we have to have a beautiful, sustainable planet to live on. And we need to have education systems that enable this. We need to have career development opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have societies where people are supported. Um, so, you know, the roadmap, I can, I can see it a couple different ways, Mark. I, I see like these different units of analysis. First of all, there's the personal. Like, how, how do I accelerate and support that ultimate objective? Well, I think it's the way I treat other human beings, right? So I would hope I would be the person who would treat the janitor um, at my office building the same way I would treat an influencer at a global citizen festival, the same. I hope I would be that kind of person. I hope I would be kind and thoughtful and respectful of people's differences and, and really help support other people. So, you know, on a personal level, it starts with me. And it always starts with me. Um, and then on a societal level, I think, you know, I loved your analogy in, in looking at space because... Um, as you mentioned, I was the MC for NASA's Cross Industry Summit that happened at the Space Center this past year. It's in just November, past last November. Yeah, <laughs> I guess a year and four months ago. It feels like two months ago. Um, 
it was interesting there because who did we pull together? We had futurists, we had musicians, we had um, world renowned violists, we had founders and CEOs of drone companies providing life saving drugs in Sub Saharan Africa, alongside senior vice presidents from Amazon and Salesforce and other huge corporates, right? We had government leaders. And what were they doing on a societal level? They were re-envisioning exactly what you're talking about, right? And everybody had a different approach to it. And it was the power of that synergy that was created by saying, here's our common goal. Now, how do we create, create the right roadmap? And one would say, well, in my startup founder space, this is what I can do. And this other magician would say, well, I'm an influencer and I work in these different kinds of spaces. This is what I can do. And we would sort of map onto um, those different sort of mini objectives. And then we would make like a pinky promise to one another that we were going to do something uh, with respect to that and then hold one another accountable, right? So on a societal level, I think that's a great template to follow. It's pulling together all those diverse voices. It's making goals together and then keeping one another accountable. And then I would say on the largest level, which is just humanity generally, um, we can't lose sight of the fact that um, a friend in a Bangladeshi refugee camp is worthwhile and should be able to have access to the same types of opportunities I do. And so if I feel interconnected, if I, if I say, wow, there was this terrible earthquake in Indonesia, it may not be immediately impacting me in this moment, but it does impact me, right? Or here's a supply chain. I just, I, I picked up these Amazon, or, um, Amazon delivered Nike shoes, and it happened to be made in these seven countries. And one of these countries ha happens to have really poor labor laws. And there's a girl my age working in one of those factories and she's adversely affected by that. So therefore I am adversely affected by that. And so if we see one another as being interconnected and interdependent, um, it makes it easier to go back to that whole concept of what am I doing when I talk to the janitor at the grocery store, right? And at my office building. And so individual society, and as humanity, I really think that's the way we we reach that ultimate objective. So, you know, I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. And the reason I asked that question is really, and I've asked it to all my guests and, and many others, I've done kind of a study over the last, uh, since 2015, asking people, what does a world that worked for everyone look like for them? And it, it's just another twist on what's the future because um, a lot of us were all over the world and I'm, I'm kind of overgeneralizing now, but you know, whether we're in the United Kingdom or in the US or in Amazon or, or Africa or, um, or Europe, um, each one of us has different governances and different rules and regulations and laws. And, and um, for me, I see them as business models. I see them as models uh, or a roadmap for the future. And so what I do is I take those models and I push them out into the future. Say this current model that w whether it's uh, Trump or Bolsonaro or Putin or Shea or the UK or or the European Union, what's the model we're operating on and let's push it out in the future and what does that future look like based on that model? And is someone, a government, uh, delivering that future to me? Or am I part of this, the Green New Deal or this uh, whatever, whatever plan there is? And you would be surprised how many people were like, uh, I mean, you know, I, I think it's this, it's that, it's for them. A lot of people have it for them. And, and, and it's really, it's really telling and it's interesting because what I found out is one, nobody's ever mentioned the sustainable development goals, not one person, which is uh, crazy for me. 
Um, and no one's ever mentioned the Green New Deal. No one's ever mentioned the donut economy. Nobody's ever mentioned planetary boundaries or, or any other model that has, has been pr presented, not even regenerative capitalism, nobody's mentioned, uh, which, which are some models in place. And so a person, a ship without a model, without a roadmap, without a plan for the future is, is just adrift, is never going to reach that goal because they don't have it or they don't know how to, to do it. And what most of us are, what, what happens is we're waiting for someone else to deliver the future to us. And what, what we've seen in the past and what we've seen during this pandemic is that there's more unrest, there's more dis-ease in the world because our, our, our civilization frameworks are just not working for us all anymore. There's people suffering and, and dying and impoverished and, and um, because of the rules and the laws and the governance that we have in certain parts of the world and, and we have uh, this dis-ease. And so I want to just take this opportunity, if you don't mind, to say, I think we've, we've missed a historical precedence. I think we've totally let it go over our heads or we didn't even realize what a historical moment we're living in in a time. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals were developed uh, and released on September 25th, 2015. Six, you know, going into the sixth year now. And they are the world's first ever global moonshot. They are a historical precedence for the first time in human history. Have we had 197 countries come together for the first time ever and agree on a roadmap, a plan, an action, targets and indicators, monies and actions, steps that need to be taken to just get us to December 2030, just to 2030 and to try to keep us at 1.5 degrees of warming. If you know anything about politics or governance or countries, it's hard enough for two of them to agree where they're gonna go eat lunch or what movie they're gonna watch. Uh, but 197 agreed on a roadmap for a better future. It is a plan, it is a plan for the future. And it's, it's not perfect, it's not the best uh, um, because it only takes us so far. And what, but what it does, it creates a sustainable infrastructure. There's still work to do, and we're, we're still going to need plans and goals afterwards. But it's so vital to know that, that that does exist, and it is a roadmap. And there's any question that you would have uh, that would need to be answered, whether it's from a business perspective or a personal perspective, of what you could do and how you could get engaged in those goals to ensure yourself a better future um, is there. And, and so that, that's, what, that's what I'd like to say because that I'm an advocate, I have to say it. And, and, um, and I would take in stealing a little bit of your time on the show to kind of discuss that. But I also know from your um, advocacy work from Global Citizens and other advocacy work that you've done for non for foundations and nonprofits and that, um, how, how do you feel about um, trying to find a system, a plan that really works for everyone, a world that works for everyone, not just for a few, but for everyone? You know, excellent question. Given the widespread, unprecedented support for the sustainable development goals. I, th I think as you say, it's, it's imperfect, but we have a plan, right? So why reinvent the plan? Let's, let's work on those different aspects of that roadmap where we can move the needle in the most impactful ways. Um, like you said, it, I mean, historical in terms of that type of support from such a vast array of countries and different stakeholder entities, um, so given that we're relatively on the same page with respect to this, let's just do the work now, right? Let's yeah. do the work around 
those issues. So I, th I think what it takes is the individual stakeholders to just calibrate around like, where are my core competencies? You know, we ask that with, of businesses all the time. Like when you're involved in a startup, where are your core competencies? How do you see yourself across the space? You know, you have competitors in the space. You know, in, in, in the case of the sustainable development goals, here's a, you know, sustainable goal number one, two, three, four, five, six, whichever it is. Um, where are your core competencies within that? And how can you make the greatest comp, um, uh, contribution? And most importantly, you're not going to do it alone. So what are other players in that space, either competitors or competitors or collaborators that you can team up with um, to, to make it meaningful, um, to make it scalable? Something that you've also addressed in, in, in the beginning uh, of our conversation is so the real successes from Delta and from Minerva and, and um, some other organizations that you've worked with. And, and, and I want to just make it clear. So I, I've been talking about this at least since 2015, but environment uh, a, a lot longer. And there was always this hesitation, especially from a business aspect, that it's expensive, it's a uh, more compliant, it's how can we do our reporting, uh, it's corporate social responsibility, it's expensive and hard to do sustainability, it's not very profitable, it's the, the return. That has been flipped on its head. So for at least two years, we have actually blown uh, the shutters off, uh, off of that type of thinking totally because this last year was the proof that those organizations that had made the shift like Delta and going uh, carbon neutral and, and, and making these uh, efforts towards the sustainable and development, that it's just a better business model. There is such a return, even in a time where Delta was so, so hard hit, as, as they come back, it's only gonna function and show that it's a better business model, not only for the earth, but for that organization, as far as investments, returns, uh, and a rally of your employees that they're working for a company that is really working on one of these systems dynamic business models, a platform business model that takes people and planet and the environment closely into consideration and all that they do. BlackRock, Microsoft, Delta, and thousands of other organizations 25 or no, 26 out of 28 on the Morningstar review, all uh, sustainable index funds outperformed their conventional counterparts. Um, I think it was eight out of 10 or nine out of 10 sustainable index funds, N Nikki index, uh, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, S&P 500, S&P Global, on and on. All four quarters of the most economic downturn and the worst uh, year we've faced since the Spanish flu um, all did well. They weathered fairly well. They, uh, they were continuing to go pretty well compared to their conventional counterparts, meaning those who weren't doing anything with sustainability, environmental protection, or human health. And so there is, is the proof that we've been waiting for, that it's a better model, that there are better models that exist out there that can unify us as global citizens, that can give us a better model to operate with for the future. And so, I, you know, I, not to heart, but you, you said it. When you said that, that's what I'm hearing. That's what's going through my mind that, wow, yeah, exactly. Here, here's the proof. But some people don't see, for some reason, that's not always seen. And so I'd like to get your perspective on that as well. Love it. I'll speak to two aspects of what you said. The first, with respect to um, the critique around a lot of the multilateral sort of bureaucracy that's associated with that. Um, I would actually echo that. I think just like any other institution, multilateral institutions need to innovate. And part of that is getting rid of a lot of the bureaucracy, which makes um, entry into the system buy-in a little bit more difficult for individual players um, to accept. So I, I've seen some amazing changes in recent years, and but I think they can do more um, to enable that uh, more inclusive environment, less bureaucratic, uh, more fast moving, which 
uh, ultimately is going to provide the innovation necessary because you can't innovate in within a dinosaur like structure right um, and corporations know a lot about that like you you sometimes have to create an entirely new division that's going to handle the innovation part because if you get stuck in the recesses of the traditional sort of divisional responsibilities etc things will be so slowly moving that you'll miss out on the innovation opportunities so I, I, I think there's opportunity for the multilaterals like the United Nations um, to to really change and adjust. Secondly, um, to making the business case. You provided a lot of amazing illustrations of how it is in a business's best interest to do things the right way for the right reasons. You can make, as you said, the, the return on investment argument. It's better for a business. It's better for your revenue at the end of the day. Um, you mentioned uh, Delta's CEO, Ed Bastian. I have so much respect for him. He's a wonderful man. Look at what he's done pre-pandemic in announcing uh, the attempt for carbon neutrality. And by the way, he was teaming up with Global Citizen, um, other advisors like you um, in the space to, to, to really make this happen. And then the pandemic hit. And, you know, we've lost, as I mentioned, billions of dollars. But what has Ed done? He's become an even greater, more impactful leader, not just within aviation, but across all of business and outside of business. Why? Because he's taken the moral imperative in many regards. He's addressed the hard issues around um, more diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. And, you know, he was just interviewed, I believe it was on CNN just two weeks ago, saying, yeah, we have a problem. I'm looking around Delta at other C-suite executives and others in the space, and I'm realizing that we do not have enough people of color. Min middle management, very different. General, you know, employee base, but like in the highest levels of this organization, things need to change. And he's been very forthright about that. He also took a stand with Black Lives Matter. Um, he's taken a stand um, against a lot of uh, government policies that were harmful. And so corporate leaders can do that and they can make the business case to their uh, executive teams and to their boards of directors saying that, you know, as, as Ed's done, this may not make the most financial sense, for example, to um, eliminate middle seats um, from our sales pool through April as he's done and continue to sort of enlarge that. But because he's teamed up with the Mayo Clinic, and this is what they're suggesting is the right thing to do, given the pandemic conditions we live under, he did it. And you could say that Delta's brand equity, which has, by the way, a monetary value, um, has increased exponentially. And when things pick up, the customer base will not forget that. They will not forget the stand that Delta made to do things the right way. Right. And so, as you said, you can make a business case to corporates. You can speak about startup founders and say, let's let's create a sustainable business that has profit generation, but that also has a social and ecological goal. I let's totally create, agree. you know, the the teams, um, your employee base where you have, you know, access to child care and you're you're providing living wages like that just feels right. And you can still make profit uh, around your products and services. And then go to the government entities and say, you know, you have a responsibility to innovate here too, governments. Um, you can't sit stagnant. Like you need to reform your education systems. You can bring on private entities to help you with that. Um, you need to get the funding um, for, for what you need to do to innovate. And, and you have an obligation and a responsibility to represent the people who put you into office and to serve those disenfranchised populations. So I think on all levels, um, as you're saying, you can make a case as to why this is the right way to proceed and essentially the only way to proceed. Well, what, uh, one last thing, and then I'll done harping on the uh, sustainable development goals. A lot of people kind of blows by them. They don't understand um, what, what to you, what does the word development mean? Development. Mm. Well, 
I think you have the old notion of international development from like an economist perspective that said, you develop towards a certain level of socioeconomic status as individuals in a country. And this is the way to do it. Here's your pathway. It's a linear trajectory and ready, set, go. Yeah. Um, we learned that that didn't necessarily work. And so, you know, people like me who subscribe to a different way say, we don't want to throw out capitalism entirely, the baby out with the bathwater. However, we have to address that inequality is higher than it's ever been. And therefore, we subscribe to inclusive capitalism. You know, the circular economy, the donut concept as you were talking about and on and on and on and and as a result we have to sort of recalibrate around not only defining what development means but that it's not a linear path and so every uh, group of people needs to sort of identify for themselves what they deem as development and what they want to work towards and then we just enable them to do it it's absolutely you're absolutely right it's uh, so true it's very far reaching though because not only is it an individual thing it's individual development on education and, and your own but it's economic development which is for for decades has been very linear and and in certain respects and then there's been some technological advancements that have had the exponential curve on them um but break it down even further a development is something you see in a residential development a commercial development it's what builds an economy so without anything there without anything built in the built environment any products there is no economy without planting the seed without building a house building a school there is no development not only personal but not only uh, economy uh development economic development because there's no learning or sleeping or anything going on. And so to throw the word sustainable in front of development, it's, it's the infrastructure. Sustainable development is an infrastructure that will support us in the future. And to be sustainable means to have enough resources and uh, enough monies to pay your employees, enough resources to produce your products in the future, to sustain oneself for future generations in the future. And a sustainable development is an infrastructure that will ensure that our kids, our grandkids, and future generations will not be left with the ruins that we've built up, that we haven't continued to develop, that we haven't continued to get up to speed with our exponentially growing world. And so it's really nice to have that knowledge that actually we're working towards that better future, towards better education, towards homes that are more passive and, and energy efficient and, and ones that aren't having a big impact on our environment. And more importantly, uh, that, that food is not causing human suffering, the lack of or that which we eat, whether it's malnutrition or obesity, and also having a ripple effect on our environment because it's not the oil, coal, and gas industry. It's not the airline industry that's the biggest cause on human suffering and environmental problems. It's our agriculture, seafood, food, and beverage industry. It's the biggest impact on human health, human suffering, and our environmental problems. I only have three questions left for you, and then I, I'm done, and, and we'll leave you a little bit room on the, on the floor to kind of tell us if there's anything you missed to to um, you would like to share with us, but these are selfish uh, questions that I'm asking for my audience. I want to give them something that they can take back from our conversation and maybe apply into their lives. If there was one message you could depart that was a sustainable takeaway and had the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Mm. So many angles I could take, but likely the most important to me would be to create the conditions in your life to become a purposeful leader. 
And I've shared this on other podcasts before, but I had a really unique meeting with the head of entrepreneur development for Google, met him at Oxford, Puneet Argawal. Um, and he had been hired by the C-suite executives and the founders of Google to train them in their own entrepreneurial journeys. He had worked with over 10,000 leaders and met with them at headquarters in California. And he said, you know, Nikki, out of all of these 10,000 leaders I've worked with, how many do you suppose I would consider true leaders? And I said, I, I, I don't know. I'm super curious. I, I have no idea. 20%? He said, no, 0.1%. And he said, it is those people who differentiate by them, themselves by the purpose that drives everything they do as leaders. And so I would encourage each of us to get clear on what our purpose is. Find the headspace to really be reflective and see what your North Star is, what, what is important to you, you know, further to your analogy, like what is that societal structure, that house that we want to build and you know how do I find purpose in that large overarching goal and so every individual decision from taking this particular job or how I interface in this in this board meeting or you know which organizations I choose to align myself with are going to be very intentional because you're architecting your own future as a purposeful leader and when you do that with authenticity, and when you do that with passion, and, you know, as I say to my students, it's the things that keep you up at night, because they're so disconcerting, but they also get you out of bed in the morning. Um, you'll find purpose, and it's that purpose that's going to drive you and inspire others to find their own purpose as well. What have you experienced in your professional journey so far that you would love to have known from the start? Mm. This is also part of the conversation I had with Puneet because he looked over my resume and he said, wow, Nikki, you've sort of done all these different things. Do people ever struggle as they try to pigeonhole you into one thing? You know, is she an academic? Is she you know, just exclusively in the business world, is she a nonprofit person? And they can't. And I said, occasionally. And he said, if, if they ever sort of criticize you for that, you know what you should say to them? And, and I said, what? And he said, say, thank you. Because if you've been true to your purpose in all of that, you've known exactly what you were doing. So for me, it would be to question myself less um, and to follow intuition in like, does this feel right to be a part of this? Is this the skill that I need to, to get movement around the needle for this thing? Um, do I want to be aligned to this specific person? You know, is it important for me to attend this conference or should I instead be at this other place or with my children, right? And, you know, it's, it's trusting myself, but it's also like constantly being intentional about that decision-making. Um, because oftentimes I have a choice of good, 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 or good, better, best, or bad, awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, being intentional about that decision making, um, I think could have saved some time for me. I totally agree. What, and this is the last question, uh, what should young innovators, potential teachers, professors in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make a real impact, especially in the future of education? I would say trying to think of the most innovative ways, deploying the best technical, or excuse me, technological tools we have at our disposal to um, solving for the digital divide, right? That's all I have for you today. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could literally talk for hours. You're like, uh, are we going to have enough content to cover? Well, we, we could talk for days. Uh, that's all I have, unless there's something that you didn't get to share with us that it would, you would like to tell us. No, I'm, I'm really satisfied with this conversation, Mark. It's been wonderful, and I've learned a lot from you as well. So thanks so much, and, and thanks to all the listeners. 
I thank you so much, Nikki, and you have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Thank <music> you.